questions. Therefore, now time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety. Global Nationals' Carolyn Jarvis revealed a shocking number last night—4,513. That's 4,513. That is how many outstanding warrants there are in Ontario for probation violations. Shocking. Mr. Speaker, how many of these 4,513 are sexual predators, pedophiles, or violent criminals? Thank you. Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. Well, thank you very much, and I thank the member uh, uh, for his question. And Mr. Speaker, I want to say to, to the Ontarian that our government takes the safety of our community very seriously, Mr. Speaker. And in partnership with our uh, police services and our justice partner, we've made Ontario one of the safest jurisdictions in North America. For 11 straight years, Ontario has had the lowest crime rate of any province or territory in Canada. Also, it's one of the six of the safest metropolitan area, according to the census. Mr. Speaker, we're building on this success through our strategy for a safer Ontario and our plan to make our communities even safer. Answer. The strategy is the biggest transformation in 25 years, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister. When asked that question yesterday, the minister said she had to look into it further and had this to say. This is from the minister. To know that number, what it means, and who are those individuals? We're all still waiting for an answer. Who are these individuals? Mr. Speaker, are they pedophiles? Are they sexual predators? Are they violent criminals? What offenders are walking our streets unsupervised with an outstanding warrant for their arrest? This is a specific question. Hopefully, the minister can answer this. These 4,513 individuals, are they pedophiles? Are they sexual Chief predators? Government are they violent criminals? This global expose is shocking, and we expect the government to take it seriously. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, as a government, we take this very seriously, and I have to say we've hired more people on parole and, proba our parole and probation officers uh, in the last few years to actually rehabilitate and reintegrate our high-risk offenders. Case per officer has also decreased by 26 per cent as a result, and many of our probation Leeds, and Granville. parole officers have received specialized training on high-risk cases uh, such as domestic violence and sex offenders, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the the opposite party has no plan, and, and we can say whatever they want, their rhetoric about fear and bringing that fear to, to Ontarians. Uh, you know, as a member of the Harper government, the leader of the opposition, fear-mongered Canadians and increased actually our prison population. This mostly due to a massive surge, Mr. Yes, Speaker, of Indigenous and rationalized inmates in our prison, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, uh, rather than attacking the opposition, this is a global national expose, a shocking response, 4,513 probation violations, criminals out on our streets. There is a team of provincial and municipal police officers that hunt down criminals who have broken federal parole. The repeat offender of parole enforcement squad, otherwise known as ROPE, continuously investigate and tries to find criminals in breach of federal parole. But there is no team looking for those breaching provincial probation. So my question is pretty simple. As the Global National Expose showed, if we're looking for those that breach federal parole, why are we not doing that provincially? We I'm struggling to get an answer here, Mr. Speaker, and rather than a partisan spin line, I would like the minister to actually tell us question. what we're going to do to keep our streets safe. You say the first. You say the first. Thank you. Minister. So, Mr. Speaker, let's look at the leader of the opposition's record. Yeah. At his time as a Harper Conservative, he actually supported measures, Mr. Speaker, of The member from Elgin, Middlesex, London, come to order. So, Mr. Speaker, as I 
was saying before I was interrupted. He did was part of a, pro, uh, of a government that has to cut Canada's correctional service budget by 10 percent, an equivalent of $295 wow. million. Dollars. Introduced a ridiculous. If it continues, those banging their desks will be warned. Finish, please. So he also introduced ridiculous changes, Mr. Speaker, to mandatory minimums yeah. and even Fair supported side. the ending of an award-winning program called Lifeline Program, which actually provided support for those serving life sentences and reintegrated those released on parole, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the opposition in this party has a big talk, Mr. Speaker, but they have a record that shows definitely otherwise. So I am very proud to be part of a government that Answer. believes in the rehabilitation, reinstation, while maintaining community safe, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. New question. The Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety. Through you, Mr. Speaker, should sexual predators and violent criminals be allowed to self-report while on probation, yes or no? Thank you. Minister of Community and Safety and Correctional Services. So again, Mr. Speaker, and I'm going to take this note because, uh, you know, there's some great work happening in our community. Our parole and probation officers are doing their job, Mr. Speaker, and yes, Always more can be done, and we are working with them. But I am so happy. The member from Dufferin Caledon, come to order. Finish, please. And, and Mr. Speaker, we have made this jurisdiction the safest community in Canada, and we should be very proud of this based on our action of working with our justice partners, with our community leaders, and our police force, Mr. Speaker. And this is why we're working through our strategy of Safer Ontario and our correctional reform, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, this is very troubling. We have a minister saying that everything's fine, that everything is safe, and yet we have 4,513. The Minister of Education come to order, and the Minister for Children and Youth Services, I'd like to remind you that if you'd like to challenge the chair, please feel free. And the member from Renfrew can stop too. Remind the member, the Minister of Children and Youth Services, that he has been warned this morning, and it carries to today. Please finish your question. So, Mr. Speaker, my question to the minister was on self-reporting, allowing violent offenders, sexual predators, to self-report. I did not get an answer to a very clear question on whether yes or no, whether the minister feels that appropriate. So I'll rephrase it. Mr. Speaker, should sexual predators and violent criminals on probation receive home visits? The probation officers want to have home visits. They want to do their job. But we have a minister that seems to have a policy that when it comes to sexual predators, question. if you pinky swear, uh, you get them a pinky swear to check up on themselves, we want home visits. We want to make sure we have to monitor violent criminals in our Thank you. Minister. So, um, Mr. Speaker, I think Ontarians in each of our community, as we showed, we have safe community, Mr. Speaker. And I think uh, I'm looking forward to see how the member will vote on our budget. Because as I go through my line, my budget has actually, within our community and safety, increasing, Mr. Speaker. So I look forward for his ability to say anything about our increasing in our budget to actually support and give tools to our parole and probation officers. The member from Dufferin Caledon, second time. You have a wrap-up sentence. So again, I look forward for him to actually vote against our wonderful budget, where we are increasing Thank capacity, you. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the minister, and I can't get an answer on this 
joke of a policy that self-reporting for sexual predators is, is okay. So I'm going to try a different angle. Yesterday, the Attorney General called this crisis, I quote, manufactured. Was the story of Kyle McLaughlin luring a child on the, in the internet manufactured? Are the 4,513 outstanding warrants manufactured? Are the violent criminals and sexual predators manufactured? I didn't make up those stories, and facts matter, Mr. Speaker. So my question to the minister is this, very clearly. Does, this, does the minister share the opinions of the Attorney General that this crisis is manufactured, or is this government finally going to take the situation seriously? Thank you. Minister. So, again, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm actually uh, not surprised but a bit disappointed that, you know, as a leader of the opposition who actually made a decision to cut services, Mr. Speaker. And I, I want to talk about this because this is, for me, so important about his record. And when you think about a no plan to keep our community no safe, plan. he supported actually a funding cut, Mr. Speaker, for the 18 circles of support and accountability program designed to prevent the most dangerous high-risk sex offenders from repeating their crime, Mr. Cut Speaker. Cut he it. also supported, as I said Let's earlier, an award-winning life line program which provided support for those Answer. serving life sentence and reintegrated those released on parole, Mr. Speaker. I'm sorry, Thank this you. party has no plan. No plan. Thank you. No question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Acting Premier. Ontario families, businesses and municipalities are struggling under the weight of soaring hydro bills. Those bills have gone up 300 per cent since the Conservatives first started to privatize the hydro system, continued under Liberal rule, in fact, 50 per cent increase since this Premier came to power alone. We've told Ontarian stories in this House for almost two years now. We've told this Premier of the families who have to choose between buying food and keeping the heat on in winter, who have to make the heartbreaking decision not to contribute to their children's education funds rather than pay their hydro bills. The Premier's response this week was to move ahead with the disastrous sell-off of a majority stake in Hydro One, a move that will guarantee that these families will continue Question. to see their hydro bills rise. Does the Premier not listen to these stories or care about the people who are struggling to get by? Thank you. Deputy Premier. Minister of Energy. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Pleased uh, to rise to talk about the 17 per cent reduction that families, small businesses and farms have received so far, Mr. Speaker, thanks to this government's Fair Hydro Plan. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, 800,000 families across the province that live in rural or remote parts of our province, they'll see between 40 and 50 per cent reduction. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, many of those families are Hydro One customers. And when we're talking about the broadening of ownership of Hydro One, Yes, Mr. Speaker, our final tranche was done this week, and with that sale, we made $2.8 billion that we can invest in things like the GTHA Go Rail Regional Express, Mr. Speaker. I know that's obviously something that the opposition party doesn't support. What about the $5.3 billion in the Eglinton yes, Crosstown or the $1 billion in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker? That's all great news for this province. Thank you. Supplementary. Again, to the acting premier, we've told the premier about businesses eager to expand and create more jobs. If only, if only they could get some relief on their hydro bills. No response for four years under her watch. We've told her about municipalities across Ontario, which are worried about having to close valued community centres and arenas because they can't afford to keep the lights on. No response. The people of Ontario have said loud and clear, stop the wrong-headed sell-off of Hydro One, which the Premier knows will only cause more chaos and damage to our already fragile hydro system. No response. Why? Thank you, Minister. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So if we go back just even a few years, we can start talking about how this government pulled costs out of the system, Mr. Speaker. $3.5 billion in the renegotiation of the Samsung agreement, saving ratepayers money. We cancelled the LRP2 project, Mr. Speaker, saving ratepayers money. We can go back further and further, Mr. Speaker, to talk about ways that this government continued to find ways to save ratepayers money on their electricity bills. The one thing that we had to do, Mr. Speaker, was rebuild a system. The system was a mess, and it was left a mess by those two governments when they were in power. We stepped in in 2003 and had to rebuild the system at a cost of $50 billion. And, Mr. Speaker, when we rebuilt that system, we made it clean and we've made it reliable, and we no yes, longer use coal in our electricity grid, something that is seen as a leadership role, Mr. Speaker, around the world. Thank you. The member from Leeds Grenville, second time. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again, to the Acting Premier. The Premier ignores 80 per cent of Ontarians opposed to the sell sell off of Hydro One. She looks away when she hears about the real and devastating impact that her mismanagement of the hydro system has had on families, businesses, and local governments. She doesn't have a credible plan to fix any of the mess that she and her government have helped create. Maybe bury it in a uh, mound of buried money. That seems to be what they're thinking about. And without a mandate and just a year shy of being booted out of office, she's decided to complete the sell-off of a majority share of one of the most profitable public utilities in this province. Does the Premier listen to anyone but Bay Street bankers, high-powered investors, and an energy minister who just doesn't seem to understand this file? Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, I'm very pleased to stand and talk about the significant reductions that families are already receiving, the 17 per cent reduction that they are receiving today. When talking about not understanding the file, Mr. Speaker, outside experts and ob observers agree that the NDP's pamphlet on what they would do with energy won't even help Ontarians. Thomas Watkin from the Toronto Star called their proposal thin gruel and said it consisted of wishful thinking, Mr. Speaker, and puts off tough decisions. This government is making tough decisions to make sure that we're bringing lasting relief right now for, for families, small businesses and farms. So we take no lessons from a party that has no plan, that has no idea, and won't do anything to help people now. We are acting. We are bringing forward legislation that is bringing forward 25 per cent reduction. That is something we should be proud of, Mr. Speaker. New question, the member from Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The acting premier. This week, New Democrat received a letter from Sarah. Sarah lives in Nor Norwich, which is just outside of Woodstock. She works at Tim Horton, trying to put herself through school. She wants to become a social worker. Sarah has a chronic eye disease that causes blur vision, dark uh, floating spots, and progressive vision loss. Sarah is 27 years old. Can the acting premier explain why she thinks Sarah should have to pay for the expensive medications for her eye out of pocket? Well, thank you, Speaker, and I will, um, I will ask the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care to respond to the supplementary. But Sarah is a perfect example of why the changes we have made to OSAP are going to transform her life. She will, I'm assuming, uh, working at Tim Hortons, she's making under $50,000 a year, and I expect significantly below that. So not only will she have free tuition, she will also have money in the form of non-repayable grants that will allow her to cover some of her living expenses. If Sarah happens to have a child, her, the news is even better for her. So, Speaker, Sarah is exactly the kind of person we had in mind when we took away the restrictions on OSAP that related to age. OSAP is now available to all students if they qualify financially, regardless of their age. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Sarah doesn't want to get pregnant. She wants help to pay for her medication. She told us, and I quote, no person with any severe health problem should be forced to choose between paying bills and paying for much needed medication. The NDP Universal Pharmacare program would help Sarah and the thousands of other Ontarians who have to make those heartbreaking decisions each and every month. Why? Is the Premier ignoring the best advice, refusing to bring in a universal pharmacare 
and refusing to help people like Sarah. Thank you. Mr. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, it gives me a great pride to be able to stand up and talk about our PharmaCare program, which is a great leap forward to what I think we all agree ultimately should be universal PharmaCare for all Ontarians and for all Canadians, and not somewhere in the future, perhaps in 2020, as with the third party's uh, uh, proposal, but actually January 1st of next year, 4 million children and youth will have access to 4,400 drugs. Absolutely free. No annual deductible, no copay, Mr. Speaker. And we continue to hear from Ontarians just how important this program is, and that there are many, many families and individuals that are celebrating the fact that, in many cases, expenses that can run into the thousands of dollars Answer. for them will now be covered under this plan starting January 1st next year. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you. Health care is based on universal access. Our health care system is built on the principle that nobody is turned away. Sarah shouldn't have to worry about school, about working, about trying to pay for her medication because she is 27 years old rather than 24. Ontarians want a fair system. They want their government to implement a fair system. Why won't the Premier bring in universal pharmacare that leaves no one behind? Thank you. Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, I think the third party needs to uh, describe their own proposal more accurately. It's not universal. It provides that the proposal is for 125 drugs. Our commitment is for 4,275 right drugs disease. more than their program, the entire formulary. Not they answer. propose to Those income test access to their program as well. It's not universal when it's income tested, Mr. Speaker. So, here, you know, to give you an example, Duran Wong Riger, who's the CEO of the Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders, has this to say. We believe Ontario's Child and Youth OHIP Plus Pharmacare program is a bold move and a really big deal for Ontario families, coming at a time when other drug plans, including the private plans, seem to be abandoning those who are most vulnerable and in need. The Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders is committed to working with the Ontario government and calls on other provinces to follow suit. Mr. Speaker, that's just one of literally dozens of examples of organizations Answer. and individuals who support, support our commitment. Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question this morning is for the Minister of Energy. Uh, Speaker, yesterday I received an order paper response from the Minister, but it really wasn't much of a response. He said he couldn't answer my question and that I should submit a Freedom of Information request. What I wanted was documents and correspondence from January and February from the Ministry, IESO and OPG that used words like fees, commissions, broker, lender and refinancing. Now, the minister knows that this House is going to have to vote on legislation uh, that he brings forward. So why is he trying to get members to pay for information that they should have before we vote on legislation? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and of course I, I always like to stand and you know, address the uh, questions that have brought forward by, by the uh, opposition. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke, second time. Oh yeah, I got, I got a checklist. Sure, yeah. And of course, Mr. Speaker, um, the Ontario Fair Hydro Plan and the relief that is coming is an important issue, and it's a position, um, you know, where we stand in this house on this topic is very well known, Mr. Speaker. But you know, what's the position? of the official opposition when it comes to their plan, Mr. Speaker. It, it makes you wonder. It's been almost 70 days now in which the leader of the opposition stood and said that they have a plan forthcoming. Um, it went from a three-point plan, Mr. Speaker, Order. to a five-point plan, to a zero-point plan, Mr. Speaker. I know part of the role of the opposition yes, should be putting forward a credible alternative, and Mr. Speaker, we're still waiting for anything credible for coming from that party. 
Supplementary. Speaker, if the minister would like us to do his job for him, we would gladly do it. But our job is to scrutinize the plan that they're putting forward. And the people of Ontario deserve to know if the government's hydro plan involves millions or billions paid out in fees to brokers or bankers. It may as well be brought to you by Goldman Sachs at this point. The people of Ontario deserve to know. They do. Because by the government's own admission, those fees will be recoverable on their hydro rates. So will the minister turn over exactly the documents I asked for in my order paper question, or will this be yet another liberal scheme done in the back rooms by a liberal minister who's got his hand in the pocket of rate payers? Shameful. Um, the last minute, the member did uh, make some statements that I am not happy with, and I would hope that he would never try to do that again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think it's important that I do remind the uh, uh, critic from the opposition party, as the critic for the energy file, that he did attend a technical briefing um, where officials gave him all the details uh, of our plan. So, I, you know, we're more than happy to share more information uh, with him. And I know we offered a, an, an additional technical briefing. And I do agree, uh, Mr. Speaker, that it is the role of the official opposition. Um, to make sure that uh, you know they question what the government is doing, I understand that rule. Um, and you know what? It, it, it also takes courage, Mr. Speaker, to bring forward a plan to talk about what they would do differently. And who thinks that, Mr. Speaker? Let me read a quote. I think the challenge for anyone who aspires to be premier, any party that aspires to serve in government, is to say what we would do. You know who said that, Mr. Speaker? The leader of the official opposition. It's just too bad when it comes to energy or Ontario, they have no plan at all. Thank you. New question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is to the acting premier. Prior to the 2014 election, the Premier told Torontonians that the Relief Line subway was one of her top transit priorities. But since the election, she has refused to commit to funding the construction of the Relief Line. Mayor of Toronto and the TTC say that the Relief Line must be built before the Young Line extension, or else there'll be transit chaos. But the Premier seems to be more interested in saving Liberal seats north of Toronto than funding a subway project that transit experts say must come first. Why is the Premier once again putting her own political interests ahead of what's best for Toronto transit riders? Minister of Transportation. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member for Park, from Parkdale for her question this morning. Uh, that member and every member in the chamber will know that we are the provincial government that is investing more in public transit in the city of Toronto and in communities in every corner of Ontario, more so than any other government in history. Speaker, our investments in transit in Toronto are, in fact, unprecedented. Now, interestingly, Speaker, just a couple of days ago at the City of Toronto, there was a staff report that came out that said, among other things, that over the next up to two years, the City of Toronto staff will continue to refine and, and provide the public with a finalized budget for some of the projects that the member opposite is talking about, like the relief line, Speaker. We look forward to seeing that information flow out of the City of Toronto, and I've said repeatedly the conversation will continue with Toronto. But in the meantime, we are the only level of government that's provided $150 million wow. in planning money Answer. to help advance the relief line, $55 million for Young North Speaker, and at the same time, we're investing literally billions in Toronto and in the 99 communities across Ontario that have transit systems that deserve our support. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back again to the Acting Premier. What Toronto want, wants is pretty clear on this file, Mr. Speaker. They have declared the relief line to be the top transit priority. Nothing new in that. And prior to the 2014 election, the Premier said the relief line was her transit priority, too. But so far, the Premier has committed exactly zero dollars to the construction of the relief line. It's impossible for the City of Toronto to plan the construction of major infrastructure projects when it doesn't know if the provincial government will be a funding partner. So I'm asking again, and it's clear. Will the Premier commit today to funding the relief line, or will she keep letting down Question. Toronto transit riders? Thank you. 
Thank, thanks very much, Speaker. I, you know, I do appreciate the passion that members on all sides of this House bring to the transit discussion and transit debate. I sincerely hope that Andrea Horv sorry, the leader of the Ontario's NDP and the third party and members of our caucus, I sincerely hope that they're not suggesting that it would be prudent for any level of government to confirm a contribution to a project for which there is not yet a confirmed budget, Speaker. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. In the meantime, I will say again, we are the only level of government that has provided $150 million to prepare or to help advance wow. the planning to make sure that the relief line is shovel ready. Speaker, one of the other problems that I have with the line of question and coming from that member and from that party is that they seem to suggest that we should favour one community over all of the other. Speaker, that's not how this side of the House views transit in the GTHA. We know gridlock is not a uniquely Toronto problem or a 905 problem. It doesn't respect municipal yes, boundaries. Sir. We need to keep investing in Toronto and in every other community that needs our support and do so in the way that makes the most sense. Speaker, that's what we have done, it's Thank what we you. are doing, and it's what we'll continue to do. Thank Thanks very much. Good question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Minister, we all know how committed our government is to helping our kids become lifelong learners. Here, here. This is a commitment as an educator that I have made many years ago. Earlier this year, you announced increased funding for education to $23.8 billion, wow. an increase of $849 million from last year. I'm also pleased to hear that 71 per cent of elementary students are achieving our, our high provincial standards in literacy and numeracy, that on, Ontario's grade 8 students are ranked the second highest in science and math in the country, and that Ontario students do outperform nearly every OECD country. Wow. Speaker, I also know that the minister made a very special announcement Question. earlier this week regarding graduation rates across the province. Can the minister please tell us about this announcement? Thank you. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Barrie for her, her question and for her relentless focus on education. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, our government 2017 balanced budget includes an additional investment of $6.4 billion a, over three years in Ontario's education system. Wow. This reflects our commitment to help learners reach their full potential by supporting them from full-day kindergarten to post-secondary education and beyond. Ontario's unprecedented investments in education have pushed the high school graduation rates to a historic new high. On Monday, I was joined by members of my Minister's Student Advisory Council to announce that in 2016, the five-year graduation rate of our high school students reached a new high of 86.5 per cent, and that's an increase of more yes, than 18 per cent since 2004, when it was just 68 per cent. This is about the hard work of students, Thank teachers, you. and uh, their parents. Thank you, Mr. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm extremely pleased to hear this fantastic news. This is an excellent example of how committed we are to ensuring that our youngest learners become successful. Since 2004, about 217,500 more students have graduated than would have if the graduation rate had remained at the 2004 level. That's a population the size of the cities of Kingston and Thunder Bay combined that now have high school diplomas. Despite this great news, we know there is still more work that can be done. This includes additional funding for a number of programs our government introduced through the Student Success Strategy that are credited with helping to sharply boost the graduation rate since 2004. Minister, please explain how these programs have helped our students achieve Question. better results and, in turn, increase the rate of graduation. Good Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, we want all of our students to, to succeed. There are a number of students in the gallery today. And, you know, we have a number of innovative programs that were introduced as part of our student success strategy, and they've helped the graduation rate. These are programs like specialist high skills major, dual credits, our expanded co-op education, our, our, our youth, um, Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program, uh, so that they could one day maybe become electricians like our friend Jim Roberts here, Mr. Speaker. And instead of using a one-size-fits-all approach, students can customize their high school experience to match their strengths, their interests, their career goals, they're creating more and engaging learning environments and better preparing them to pursue their future opportunities. 
communities. As mentioned uh, by uh, the Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Answer. Development yesterday, the new Career Kickstart program is helping students to even gain more experience from this $190 million investment, Mr. Speaker. Question the member from Nakia and Carlton. Thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. I'm joined here today by Sean O'Leary, Executive Director of We the Parents, an organization dedicated to parents of youth who are struggling with opioid addiction. Sean and his 17-year-old daughter, Paige, have courageously shared her struggle with addiction uh, to counterfeit Percocets laced with fentanyl. I've raised the uh, issue many times, including requesting the Minister of Health to visit Ottawa, where the opioid crisis is claiming the lives of children as young as 14. Uh, can the Acting Premier commit today to providing funding to deal with the opioid crisis in Ottawa? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Of Health and Long Term Care. Mr. Of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. And first of all, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, Sean O'Leary, who is in the audience with us. I'm not sure if you're here with your daughter Paige or not, but uh, oh. yes, she is. And thank you to both of you for being here today. And I want to uh, applaud uh, his advocacy and that of Paige's, uh, who is an incredibly courageous young woman. Uh, and with a, a courageous uh, father as well, that have advocated, uh, as the member opposite has indicated, very strongly uh, about the dangers uh, we're facing uh, in this opioid crisis, uh, dangers that are found throughout this country, uh, but are, uh, um, as uh, Sean and Paige can so eloquently speak to, particularly prominent in Ottawa and in the Ottawa region. Uh, and I know that they have advanced some very important uh, uh, activities and suggestions, uh, activities and suggestions that we're looking at very closely. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I appreciate that uh, acknowledgement of Mr. O'Leary and his daughter, Paige. Um, according to Ottawa Public Health, they, quote, have not received any additional information as to when, how, or to whom funds will be allocated or whether there will be any conditions or expected deliverables associated with this new funding source uh, to deal with the op opioid crisis. And so, although there has been a verbal agreement from the Premier that these funds would flow according to public health in Ottawa, it hasn't yet. I'm just wondering if the, uh, the, the minister could assure Mr. O'Leary, we the parents in Ottawa public health, that funding to fight this crisis will indeed flow and that m the answers to when, whom and how the resources will be allocated will be shared expeditiously. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I should uh, I acknowledge the, uh, the advocacy of the member opposite. I should also reference the uh, strong advocacy and involvement of the, the uh, Liberal MPPs in Ottawa as well, uh, who have met with many uh, individuals that ha either have a concern or have a responsibility to deal with this crisis. Uh, we announced $140 million in mental health supports. There are additional funds uh, in the budget uh, that we are now debating that will go specifically to uh, opioid treatment, so I look forward to the member opposite supporting the budget and supporting those initiatives. Um, we also have invested just last year $1.5 million in Ottawa to the Dave Smith Youth Treatment Centre, which will provide a 30-bed youth treatment centre for individuals that are uh, faced with addictions to opioids and other uh, narcotics. Uh, Mr. Speaker, there are 80 pharmacies in Ottawa that are providing naloxone free of charge, which Answer. is a lifesaver. Uh, we uh, have a, a very comprehensive plan that was announced last fall that we're now in the process of implementing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Sadly, the polling tells us that 90 per cent of Canadians have lost hope. They no longer believe that their children will do better than they did. When the federal Liberal Finance Minister tells workers across this country to get used to precarious employment, who can blame them? That's why Dejeuner Love is left with uh, the work that she's in. She works at Good Life Fitness, and she cannot afford to take a sick day when she has a concussion from a work injury. Worse, she and her Good Life colleagues have spent months fighting for a first contract. Hardworking Ontarians like Dejeuner expected improvements to labour standards in the budget last week, but sadly, there was nothing. Liberals have had over 14 years to actually improve working Question. conditions. How much longer do workers across the province have to wait to see improvements to working conditions from the Liberal government? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Well, Speaker, the short answer would be not very long. 
and certainly we put, I think, the right effort into this. And I hope all members of the House support the work we've done on the Changing Workplaces Review Speaker, because we know that since these two acts, the Employment Standards Act and the Labour Relations Act Speaker, will last looked at in 1995 and 2000, the world of work has changed under our feet. The, the world of work that uh, young people, as you describe, are going into is quite different from the world of work that I went into and many of the people in this House that are of my vintage speaker. And the concerns you're talking about uh, will be clearly addressed by the advisors, such things as scheduling, hours of work, sick time, emergency leave, domestic violence. These are all issues that, uh, that have seized the attention of the advisor yes, speaker. I'm looking forward to bringing in a very comprehensive report on this issue. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, New Democrats value cons consultation, but uh, the public has already made it clear what they want. We know what their concerns are. We know f we've known for years. The final recommendations are in, and it's unacceptable, Speaker, that three million workers in Ontario have to worry about losing pay if they need to take a day off because of their sick. We believe in the minimum wage. As New Democrats, we believe in protecting workers' right to join a union and to get a first contract. We believe in the same pay for the same work, and we believe in access to to sick days for workers. The Changing Workplaces Review is in. The minister has it. And so we ask again, when is the minister planning to release the final report so that hardworking Ontarians can see some change? Thank you. Thank you very much. Speaker, thank you to the member for the, um, for the question again. Speaker, the work is done. The consultations have taken place. Organized labour is being consulted, the Chamber of Commerce, the business community, poverty advocates, people that have been asking and advocating for changes to these pieces of regulation, Speaker, have had their say to some very learned individuals who have put together in a very comprehensive re report that we've taken the right amount of time, Speaker, I think to make sure that when we bring this package forward, it's going to address the needs of all working Canadians while keeping Ontario's economy competitive. What I don't agree with, Speaker, is the NDP has called this process a waste of time. And, Speaker, it's anything but a waste of time. It's work that needed to be done properly, needed to be done right, and the results, I think, Speaker, are going to support everybody that works hard in this province. Thank you. Your question, the member from Beaches East York. Well, thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation. Minister. Sorry? Go ahead. Our government is committed to reconciliation with Indigenous people through closing gaps, supporting Indigenous cultures, and reconciling relationships. Mr. Speaker, as you know so well, the residential school system was established and mandated to wipe out Indigenous cultures, and Indigenous art has stood as a testament to the resilience of Indigenous communities in the face of cultural genocide. The significant influence of Indigenous arts and culture on Canadian society too often goes unmentioned and unappreciated. Now, Speaker, my father, Mr. Justice Potts, as he toured Ontario and the Northwest Territories, often returned home with glorious pieces of Indigenous art, and we as a family were exposed to this unique Question. form early on. So I'd like to ask if the minister could elaborate and provide examples of how Indigenous art and culture and their increasing significance Thank you. in Canadian culture are being recognized. Minister of Indigenous Relations. Thank you. Um, I'd like to reference the contribution of uh, Indigenous music culture. Speaker, uh, this past weekend I attended the Hot Docs Festival on Sunday evening for a viewing of a film entitled Rumble, The Indians Who Rocked the World. It won two major prizes. It won the $50,000 prize for the audience's choice of the best documentary, and then it also won the Documentary Festival's award as the best documentary. What Rumble highlights is the underappreciated and often unknown that Indigenous musicians made to rhythm and blues, rock and roll, heavy metal music. It was a splendid documentary, and it showed the Indigenous musicians working with these world, world superstars in the rhythm and blues and rock and roll yes, and the sir. tremendous contribution they've made to that. Wow. Thank, you, supplementary. Well, thank you, Speaker. And I look forward to seeing this documentary rumble, and I want to thank the minister for the great work that he is doing and his leadership in helping heal cultural wounds in our society. 
The work that we're doing, our government is doing, supporting and investing in Indigenous art and culture is so important, and it is in complete accord with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's recommendations to emphasize the significance of Indigenous arts and culture in Canadian heritage. And I know that this is also a very important matter for the Minister of Tourism, Cultural and Sport, and that her ministry is very involved in supporting Indigenous arts and culture and providing those support so that those works of art can be seen by all Ontarians and Canadians. So, Speaker, will the minister also elaborate on how our government helps support and promote Indigenous arts and culture, Question. particularly when it comes to youth in our society? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member for Beaches East York for his advocacy and his question. A timely question indeed, as the Minister responsible for Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation has pointed out, not only in this important year, Speaker, of our 150th anniversary, but also in light of the Hot Dogs Festival, which is another program that my ministry and our government is delighted to support. We are supporting, as the, as the member pointed out, two important uh, cultural camps uh, as part of our journey of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, one uh, in, first, in uh, Fort Albany First Nation and the other in Pekanjikum. And they include activities uh, that are cultural in nature but sport too, Speaker, because we know the healing power of sport. And, and of course, it's uh, giving them also an opportunity to try out for the North American Indigenous Games, going to be held this summer, Speaker, in Ontario, supported by our government for the Answer. first time in this uh, province. So, across the board, Speaker, we're absolutely thrilled and delighted. Our support for Indigenous arts and culture is long-standing, and we look forward Thank to you. continuing to maintain that robust support. Thank you. Your question, the member for Whitby, Oslo. Yeah, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Despite the royal assent of Bill 9 and age discrimination against stroke recovery patients act in December 2016, this Liberal government continues, Speaker, to discriminate against post-stroke recovery patients between the ages of 20 and 64. Speaker Jim McEwen is one of those patients, and he's here this morning in your gallery. Because Jim is not 65 yet, he's unable to access post-stroke recovery services that he needs and deserves. That is why I introduced Bill 9, which provided access to post-stroke rehabilitation service regardless of age. But, Speaker, this Liberal government continues to not deny Jim and thousands of others Question. like him the post-structure recovery services they need. When will this government stop the discrimination of post-structure recovery patients Thank 20 you. to 64 years of age? Minister of Health, Long -term care. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to uh, commend the member opposite for uh, the initiative that he took last year, a uh, private member's bill that we supported. I think it unanimously was supported in this legislature, but it certainly passed uh, with the uh, involvement of and cooperation of my ministry, uh, the End Age Discrimination Against Stroke Recovery Patients Act. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are in the process uh, of, uh, uh, of implementing that act uh, as a government and as a ministry. Uh, I'm proud of the investments that we have been making uh, across the board. In fact, there's an important uh, investment uh, in this budget uh, that speaks to uh, um, acute care for patients with stroke, which is a game changer. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and so well, I hope I hope the member opposite, who's heckling me right now, will support this because it's critically sure. important to stroke care. Sure. But, Mr. Speaker, uh, um, we uh, continue to invest in. All right, the member from Dufferin Caledon is warned. Finish. So, Mr. Speaker, the uh, the funding in the budget. And the efforts that we're making, uh, providing publicly funded physiotherapy to stroke patients where their clinician uh, believes that it is relevant to and advantageous to their therapy, we continue to fund that in hospitals, in hospital outpatient clinics, yes, in home care, in long-term care homes, and in community physio clinics across the province. Mr. Thank Speaker. you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and back to the Minister of Health. Once again, Speaker, the intent, the intent of Bill 9 has always been to provide post-stroke recovery services to patients regardless of age, Speaker, regardless of age. So will this minister agree this morning, yes or no, to end age discrimination 
and post-stroke recovery services for those 20 to 64 years of age. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I want to acknowledge Jim in the gallery as well, uh, who uh, has taken uh, his valuable time to come and join us here in the legislature for the for this question. But, Mr. Speaker, I'm not sure what the member opposite's difficulty is because we actually, by working together, the ministry, myself, his office, him directly, we actually refined and passed unanimously his private member's bill to end age discrimination against stroke recovery patients act 2016 we are in the process as we are legally bound to as a government in legislation that was passed here we are we are providing we are implementing that act that he authored uh, and as i mentioned uh, we are continuing to invest significant millions of dollars in funding specific yes, to the aspect of physio which is mr speaker relevant and important and impactful for many post stroke patients thank you your question the member from hamilton mountain uh, thank you uh, speaker my question is to the acting premier stephen is a hamiltonian who was waiting for a liver transplant on his way to an appointment at st joe's to remove fluid from his abdomen stephen fell in the parking lot cutting his chin and losing consciousness inside at the hospital, Stephen waited to be seen. In fact, he waited for eight and a half hours. And finally, late that night, he was sent home, still bloody, still disoriented, and still with fluid in his abdomen. Stephen's heartbreaking story shows exactly what is happening to patients in dangerously overcrowded hospitals across Ontario due to years of liberal cuts and layoffs. Why doesn't the Premier see the damage that she's done to patient care? Health and long -term care. Health, long -term care. Well, Mr. Speaker, and I, I obviously can't speak to the particulars of this individual, um, but, but Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, despite what the member opposite says, we have uh, among, if not the shortest wait times in our emergency rooms in the entire country. In fact, despite so, there's third-party independent independent evidence and reports that have been issued over the past several years, including from the Fraser Institute, including from the Canadian Institute for Health Information, that demonstrate, despite an increasing population and despite increasing volumes to our ERs, the wait times have continued to go down. And in fact, 85% of ER patients are getting treatment within the target if they are a complex patient, and 89% within the four-hour target for minor patients, Mr. Speaker. So the, the wait times have actually gone down by almost 30% in the last Sir? several years, despite the fact that ER volumes have gone up by 40%, Mr. Speaker. So and the ER wait times for the most sick have gone down by 15%. Supplementary. If the minister heard me, Speaker, but eight and a half hours is not within the target time and still to be sent home. Stephen's wife, Debbie, drove him to the hospital. Debbie has mobility problems and uses a wheelchair. While in the hospital, Debbie has, had to help Stephen to get him to the toilet, then on her own had to clean him up and get him back into his bed. When they left the hospital, Debbie had to get Stephen out of the car all alone. Remember, Speaker, this woman is someone who needs to be in a wheelchair herself. Debbie and Stephen deserve so much better. But once again, the Premier's hospital funding in this year's budget falls more than $300 million short of what is needed. When will the Premier admit that she is failing Stephen, Debbie, and patients all across Ontario? Well, so I, I have to disagree with the member opposite, and I hope, Mr. Speaker, that she supports this budget because it has an infusion, member from of, Durham. An infusion of more than $500 million this year, a 3.1 per cent increase to the operating budgets of our hospitals. Mr. Wow. Speaker, it has over a billion dollars specifically dedicated to wait times, to reducing wait times throughout the hospital system. It has specific elements that add additional 
hours for MRIs, 2,800 more hip and knee replacements, wow. 2,100 more cataract surgeries. In fact, we're investing $11 billion. When you look at last year's budget and the increases that were built in and this year's, more than $11 billion more dollars over the next three years in the health care system, in the health budget. So I would hope, given her concern that she's expressed, she'll support us and support us strongly, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science. Over the past few years, Ontario has become a leading destination for companies interested in opening research and development branches. Ontario has one of the highest educated workforces in the world, a low tax rate and red tape burden reduction. These commerce-friendly policies make doing business in Ontario profitable, stable, and enticing for private entities looking to expand into new markets. A particularly exciting area is Ontario's massively expanding tech sector, an industry that is expanding at an exponential rate in my riding of Kingston and the Islands, a city where history and innovation thrive. One great example of an innovation incubator is the Breakout Project, which started yesterday at Fort Henry in Kingston and the Islands and is sponsored Question. by the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Research and Innovation and Science please tell the members of this House about tech companies investing in Ontario? Thank you, Minister of Research, Innovation you, and Science. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands. She has been a great advocate for research and innovation, in particular at her area. Mr. Speaker, the member is absolutely correct. Companies all over the globe recognize Ontario for its reputation as a business-friendly ecosystem. Right. Mr. Speaker, just a couple of days ago, Uber, a popular rideship company that has deep interest in artificial intelligence, announced they would be starting a partnership with our Vector Institute for Artificial Intelligence as a platinum investor. This marks the first occasion that Uber has ever invested outside of the United States on research and development. The R&D office at Vector Institute will be led by University of Toronto Professor Raquel Urtasen is a move that speaks volumes to our capacity for talent retention. Mr. Yeah. Speaker, That's we will awesome. continue Sir. building our innovation economy. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Research, Innovation and Science for his answer. I am delighted to hear this fantastic news. I can't think of a better testament to Ontario's capacity for leadership in this sector. Creating new jobs isn't a simple matter of reducing red tape and supporting existing sectors. It's a matter of training a highly skilled workforce, assisting entrepreneurs in commercializing their ideas, and attracting businesses that are looking to expand into new tech economies. We need to be leaders and visionaries in the innovation field to increase our capacity, and we are doing that. Can the minister elaborate a bit more on the types of companies who are established in Ontario and are contributing to Ontario's economy? Thank, thank you, Mr. Minister. Speaker. Again, I want to thank the member from Kingston and the Islands for her question. I would be delighted, Mr. Speaker, to speak a little more about international investments in Ontario innovation. Last year, Versant Ventures and Bayer AG partnered to invest in Blue Rock Therapeutics, which is a stem cell research company in, based in Discovery Centre at Mars. Their investment, which was a total of $225 million, was the second largest Series A financing for a medical science company. In January of this year, Highland Therapeutics was able to secure $200 million in financing from Morgan & Stanley Company. Mr. Speaker, this is just the beginning. More and the more tech and the medicine firms are looking to invest in our province of Ontario's innovation and research. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Your question, the member from Leeds, uh, Thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the uh, Minister of Energy. Uh, Mr. Speaker, has Cabinet ever been briefed or received a document detailing the expected cost of hydro through the year 2024? Yes or no? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, very pleased to talk about uh, our Fair Hydro Plan because as we talk about the Fair Hydro Plan, we are talking about how we are moving forward in refinancing, like remortgaging our home, Mr. Speaker, a portion of the global adjustment. And with that, Mr. Speaker, we have said that this will take 
um, up to 20 years longer, Mr. Speaker, and we've always acknowledged that this will cost us a little bit more, Mr. Speaker. In terms of what we want to do, Mr. Speaker, we want to ensure that the folks and the, the families right across the province that are investing in um, our energy system will see that, Mr. Speaker, and utilize that system for the duration of its, uh, its uh, last full life. So, Mr. Speaker, in terms of what we're doing, we're making sure that we're yes, lowering sir. rates for families, farms, and small businesses right across the province. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, uh, back to the minister. Uh, that didn't answer the question. So let me ask you this: What is the expected cost of hydro in 2024? Here, here. Good question. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm sure maybe he does. Maybe he can look in it and see their plan. Um, maybe they can find what they would do in terms of what they would do to lower rates now, Mr. Speaker. You're warm. Oh, no, it's just a reminder, that's all, in case you were thinking about it. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know their policy is going to come up in the magic weekend in November, um, but on this side, we're worrying about families now, Mr. Speaker. We're worrying about small businesses now, and that's why we're bringing forward Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan, with, on average, we'll reduce rates by 25 percent on average, but right now, Mr. Speaker, rates are lower by 17 percent. That is something that families, small businesses and farms right across this Thank province you. are applauding, Mr. Yay. Speaker. New question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Acting Premier. As you are aware, a recent announcement from Woodbine Racetrack on their new stable policies will stop any horse stabled at Woodbine from racing on another track more than once a year. Alongside 40 new turf, turf race dates, Woodbine is going to offer $5,000 claimers, $6,200 conditioner claimers on the main track. Quite frankly, this policy is completely self-serving and will have serious negative impacts on Fort Erie Racetrack. The Fort Erie community has serious concerns about the negative effect this will have on the beloved track, putting a thousand jobs in jeopardy. I have spoken to the mayor. The Ontario Racing Commission and the Ontario government should immediately stop Woodbine in its tracks and ensure horse owners have the ability to stable their horses wherever they want, Question. as long as they want and whenever they want. Fort Erie expects nothing else. I ask the Premier again, will you please stop, step in, address this important issue, Thank you. and stop the unfair attack on the livelihood of Fort Erie. Thank you. Deputy of the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And, and I really want to thank the member for Niagara Falls. He was very uh, courteous about a week ago. Uh, he provided me the information, the background uh, about Fort Erie and its relationship uh, with Woodbine, the two, uh, of course, thoroughbred tracks of the province of Ontario. Uh, Fort Erie Racetrack, of course, hosts the second leg of uh, Canada's uh, Triple Crown, the Prince of Wales Stakes that will be held there in and around uh, July 25th. And I indicated uh, to the, the member uh, that we're taking a, a look at this uh, right now, and I certainly committed to him just earlier this morning uh, that I would be back to him uh, in a timely way. Thank you. Member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, on the point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to welcome Rebecca and Wesley Herger from the great riding of Bruce Gray, Owen Sound, who have joined us at Queen's Park this morning. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I just noticed that my good friend, the warden of Peterborough County, Joe Taylor, is at the Members East Gallery. We welcome Warden Taylor here to Queen's Park today. We welcome all of our guests. We have a deferred vote on the Government Notice of Motion Number 10 relating to allocation of time on Bill 127, an act to implement budget measures and to enact, amend and repeal various statutes. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
All members, please take your seats. All members. On May 10, 2017, Mr. Nack will move government notice of motion number 10 relating to allocation of time on Bill 124. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Mr. Cadre. Mr. Cadre. Mrs. Mangas. Mrs. Mangas. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Darmelin. Ms. Darmelin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Nadu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milch. Mr. Milch. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Reneal. Ms. Reneal. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hardin. Mr. Hardin. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Osterhoff. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Pettipe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Denovo. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natashek. Mr. Natashek. Madame Gelina. Madame Gelina. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 49, the nays are 34. The ayes being 49, the nays being 34, I declare the motion carried. There being no further deferred votes, this House stands recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.